My name is Warren Berkowitz. I'm the manager of the Good Life Center. Uh, the Good Life Center is the last homestead of famous authors Helen and Scott Nearing. They moved here in the early 50s when their book Living the Good Life became published and it became very popular in the post-World War II era but they became very popular in the 60s and 70s. They were considered icons of the Back to the Land movement. In 1976, uh, I came up and met them. I was one of thousands of young people that made the pilgrimage up to meet uh, Helen and Scott and talk to them about their lifestyle and view their lifestyle. And that year, I made the decision to move to Maine, as did a lot of people. At the time, um, there were a lot of people involved in the, what they call the kind of countercultural movement in the United States, uh, people who were looking for alternative ways to live because of the civil rights movement and the Vietnam War era protests. And uh, so I came up and met them and uh, enjoyed meeting them and decided that Maine was a good place to settle. I was also greatly influenced by their, uh, by their writings and also their teachings in terms of organic gardening and vegetarianism. And so that is the legacy of the Good Life Center, is our job, our mission is to promote their legacy of vegetarianism, homesteading, simple living skills, and social and economic justice. Uh, this is the, their kitchen. They heat it and cook with wood. And so the wood stove was going year round. Uh, Helen uh, wasn't much of a cook in that uh, she really preferred to be outside working side by side with Scott. Their diet, 80% uh, of their diet came from the garden. They were very generous with their time. Thousands of people would come up each year to see how they lived and talk to them about uh, homesteading and simple living. And oftentimes they would be invited to share a meal with them. And um, they were very generous with their time. Uh, and so I really have a lot of respect for that aspect of their lifestyle. At the time I was actually living outside of Boston teaching at a residential school uh, for children and uh, I started reading a magazine called Mother Earth News and that was all about alternative ways to live and uh, Helen and Scott had a regular column in that magazine at the time and then I was uh, moved to read their book Living the Good Life and that also talked about their life in Vermont and the ways they lived organically. Uh, they have a 3,000 book library. There are a lot of books on gardening and health, and um, also there are books on religion and spirituality, which was mostly uh, Helen's interest. And then in Scott's study next door, there are a lot of books on politics and capitalism and socialism and communism. So a wide range of, uh, of interests and intellectual pursuits. I met them in 1976. I really got to know them well after I met my wife, who, was, who had become very good friends of, that, of Helen and Scott. Uh, she worked side by side with Scott in the garden and then uh, helped Helen. When Scott's uh, health uh, declined when he was uh, 99 years old, uh, my wife Nancy and Helen took care of Scott until he died at the age of 100. Um, so, during that time, I could, got to know Helen and Scott really well, came to really respect their, their philosophies, their intelligence, their, uh, their way they articulated uh, their lifestyle and their life ideas. Uh, they're a very interesting couple. Uh, Scott was 20 years her senior. They met in the 1920s um, after Scott had a, a long career in academia and politics. Uh, very interestingly, they both came from very wealthy families. Um, yet they decided to live a very ascetic life and a life very close to nature, which was very impressive to me as a young person. I thought that was really amazing that they had kind of turned their back on their inheritance and adopted this life that was very difficult physically um, to live, but they thought that that was the right way to live and uh, their, their lifestyle really became an example for an entire generation and now several generations of uh, people because of their firm belief in living close to nature, looking at nature for solutions to um, kind of environmental issues, and um, living an organic lifestyle. And this one's in progress. So what you do is you build this crib 
and the concept of the crib, this is Scott's idea, is to provide a space for the composting to happen and to a lot of air, a lot of, let a lot of air into the process. Okay, because you need air, water, and warmth to allow the, the composting process to happen. So you take all your kitchen waste, all your garden waste, weeds, whatever from the garden plants that have, you know, been harvested, you don't need any more. And we also cut a herb called comfrey that also has really deep roots and is really high in minerals and trace minerals, and we add that. And then we also uh, layer it with seaweed. We collect seaweed in the cove, bring it up here and layer the compost with that. <clears throat> and we'll build the, the uh, compost heap to about this height, about four feet high. And, <clears throat> and then just leave it. And so this one we're working on also. You can see the garden waste in here. These are old <clears throat> squash plants that we harvested. And we just layer it. And you can see there's a layer of seaweed in there. Again, we'll build it up to about four feet. At some point, the seaweed will start to decay and decompose. And uh, then the compost heap will actually heat up. It'll heat up to like 150 degrees whereas you can put your hand on it and feel the heat. And that means the seaweed and the greens are starting to decompose. And as they do that, the compost heap will start shrinking. So it'll start at about four feet and it'll shrink so much that it'll end up looking like that, which is about two feet high. So that look like that at some point. It'll shrink which means that all the organic matter is decomposing and it'll also cool down after a couple of weeks, sometimes as much as three weeks, but often like two weeks it'll be hot. Once it cools down, the earthworms will come from the ground, come into it and start doing their thing, eating and um, leaving castings, which adds to the uh, fertility of the compost. And so Scott's idea was to allow as much air in it as possible to help the decomposition process. And these uh, <coughs> stakes in the middle are a, are a way to allow air to get down into the middle. And so all this waste that is totally free turns into beautiful dark soil called compost. And here's a good example of what that waste looks like. Beautiful fertilizer for the garden and we dig it out and we sift it because some of the things take longer than a year to decompose so the stuff that we sift out we'll put into a new compost heap and give it another chance to decompose and so that when we put this on the garden it's just basically black gold all for free just layer it leave it come back a year later well, their, their idea was that they wanted to buy time and they really value time so that uh, they split their day up into uh, a few hours of what they call bread labor where they really worked hard around the homestead. Then they um, dedicated some hours to their intellectual pursuits. They were, just, they were both amazing writers and readers. And then they also dedicated part of their day to community service. And that's how they lived their life and they felt that that was a really very disciplined and effective way to live one's life. And uh, they weren't so concerned with money as they were with having the time to live this type of lifestyle. And uh, they wrote about it in Living the Good Life and that was a, uh, one aspect of the book that uh, really influences a lot of people. Growing vegetables year round in a sun heated greenhouse. They experimented with a lot of greens and things like that. Um, this is a very simple design with the stone and the single pane glass, yet it works really well. Uh, for us here on the homestead, we grow some of the crops that need a lot of extra heat, like tomatoes and peppers and eggplants. We grow in, in the greenhouse. Uh, but for the nearings, they would like plant 50 spinach plants in, uh, in November, and then maybe 10 of them would survive. 
but they had some fresh greens in March and uh, April. And uh, they also experimented with uh, kale and bok choy and some of the other kind of Asian greens uh, to see what they could grow year round. Uh, so that was a really interesting uh, aspect of the homestead. But the greenhouse was also very important in, in uh, growing the seedlings early in the spring. And uh, come on in. So this is the end of the season, so there aren't many tomatoes left. We've harvested most of them. And since our season ends next weekend, we'll pull all this out and re-fertilize and get it ready for the spring. But if we were living here year, year round, we would be planting lettuce and kale and winter crops. So again, unfortunately, you're seeing the end of the season garden. We're putting things away, um, pulling crops and getting the uh, garden ready for the winter. Uh, there's still a few greens you see chard and kale and um, a few things still growing, but mostly we're putting it away. Uh, the Good Life Center, as I mentioned before, the mission of the Good Life uh, is to promote their legacy, their legacy of organic gardening and or organic living, uh, homesteading skills and simple living skills, and social and economic justice and vegetarianism. So the Good Life Center is a nonprofit. We were formed in 1995 uh, when Helen died. A bunch of her friends got together, including myself and my wife, and we formed the Good Life Center. And uh, we invite people to come and see their last homestead, Forest Farm here in Harborside, Maine. And we run it like a demonstration um, homestead. We are powered by solar power. Uh, we have a 3,000 book library that we have to have dehumidifiers and keep a good climate control and that's all done with solar energy. We have a composting so toilet system that uh, the compost from there goes and fertilizes the apple orchard that we have. And then we garden organically and we have um, the Nearings didn't use any uh, animal products at all on their garden. So no manure, or no blood meal. Uh, things like that. So we also do that. And so we're a demonstration of how to compost the way uh, Helen and Scott did and also how they garden. So people from all over the world come here and see the way Helen and Scott lived. And uh, oftentimes they leave very inspired by uh, our example and the example that Helen and Scott did. Uh, they built this beautiful house and gardens uh, when they were in their 70s and, uh, and Scott was in his 90s and they did it through hard work. They had a lot of volunteer help at times, but basically it was their work and uh, it, it's pretty amazing. And so come on up and see us and uh, I think you'll, you'll enjoy uh, visiting here and learning about the nearings and learning about uh, how to homestead uh, in Maine on the coast of Maine.